comes from the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. And then the second reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. And with many other words, Peter warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. For those who missed the presentation the other evening given by missionaries that we had come to Mount Hope from Iraq, it was a very eye-opening experience. It was Greg and Chris Callison husband and wife team, they are uh, uh, PCUSA uh, missionaries, have been working in Iraq for, well, well, since the first Gulf War when the no-fly zone was established in the Kurdish zone and they were finally allowed to go in, where no Westerner had been allowed to go since 1969, having been booted out of the country by Saddam Hussein at that point. They live and work among the Kurdish population in northern Iraq. The Kurds are not Arabs, they're very different people that live among the Arabs, mainly in the mountain areas of four different countries, Syria and Iran, Turkey and Iraq. The greatest number live in Turkey, the next largest number is in Iraq and in Iran. They're the largest ethnic group in the world that does not have their own country, their own nation. And as such, they have often been persecuted by the countries they are a part of. They've been slaughtered by Turks, they have been gassed and had chemical weapons used against them by uh, Saddam Hussein, and the Iranians have at times hunted them. And so that's why they live in the mountains. It is safe there for them. But despite that, the oldest Protestant church in the Middle East can be found in what was once Kurdish territory in Mosul, Iraq, which is now right next to Kurdish territory. The oldest Protestant, oldest Protestant church Presbyterian Church. But it is unreachable at present because the country, the city there, uh, since the U.S. troops have pulled out, has been controlled first by Al-Qaeda and now by this ISIS group from Syria that has taken over a large swath uh, of Iraq's territory. And so the Kurds there are once again in danger. The, the missionaries that came had a picture taken from the roof of their house where they live, and in the distance you can see the end of a lake. Behind the mountain, which you can't see, is a dam, the Mosul Dam, which has recently been taken by the forces of ISIS. The people have been beheading those that disagree with them in large numbers. Um, they are that close to danger. They have come back for their uh, summer tour to tell churches what they've been doing, and they're going back there in October. And so these are people who risk their lives. They actually said they wish they were there now, even though it's dangerous because the people they love and work among are there. So remember them and, and keep them in prayer. The Kurds are 
to the church, largely in the unreached people. Uh, out of the 30 million Kurds, only 250, not 250,000, only 250 proclaim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because it is a very dangerous thing for them to accept the Christian faith. Even though great numbers of people are interested in the faith, interested in Jesus Christ, if they become a Christian, it is a decision that can cut them off from their family and can even endanger their lives from family who sometimes engage in honor killings and also from the extremists who at any time uh, can break through upon them and uh, cause them to make a life and death choice. Reaching unreached peoples is what the church is all about. Presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world by showing and telling the love of Jesus Christ and about the salvation to be found in Him, that's what the church is about. It is the Great Commission, it is the last commandment that Jesus Christ gave to us before He ascended into heaven. Go into all the world, sharing what I have shown you and commanded you, and baptizing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So contrary to what our popular opinion in America is often about, church is not about entertaining ourselves. It's not about money, though we have to deal with money. It's not about buildings, though we have to deal with buildings. It's not about other things. Our main purpose in the church is about souls. Souls who cry out for Jesus Christ, even souls that don't know what they're crying for, but who need that love, and we are the ones who can show them that. We need long-term missionaries like folks in, in the Kurdish areas, and we thank God for them. 30 million people is a lot of folks. But do you realize that in America, there are 100 million people who don't go to church anywhere? Some of them may proclaim to be you know, the Baptist or Methodist faith or whatever, but really don't go anywhere, really don't have much to do of anything with faith. Think about that. 30 million Kurds are considered an unreached people. But all around us we have 100 million in our own country. People who also need to hear about the love and the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Contrary to popular opinion, church isn't about entertaining ourselves. It's not about money. It's not about buildings. It's about souls. Millions of souls. It's a job that is almost unfathomable. We might say, what in the world can we do? But like those missionaries in Kurdistan, we know that God works through our weakness, shows His strength through our weakness. And in the end, the results of what we do is up to God and rests on Him. But it is still ours to go out into the world, to live the gospel of Jesus Christ, to tell about His love, and to show him to everyone that we meet by both word and deed. What they're praying for in Kurdistan is a revival, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a major way. And what we should be praying for is a revival, both there and here. Twice in my life, I have seen such a revival. I'm not talking about a soul coming to the Lord here or there. That's a wonderful thing. Every soul is important. Every person is important. I'm talking about a massive move of the Holy Spirit that sweeps through a church, sweeps everything before it, and sweeps out of the church into the community around it, changing lives and communities forever. I saw it once in the mountains of East Tennessee when I was a boy. And I saw it once again in small villages in Russia when I was older. I saw the Holy Spirit poured out in hatreds and feuds and heartbreaks and heartaches and grief and despair swept away before it. And in countless lives, those things replaced by peace and love and joy in Jesus Christ. I've seen scars healed. I've seen hearts and souls healed. I've seen relationships healed. I've seen bodies healed. And I've seen souls saved. It was powerful. I pray to see that again, here and now, among us. I want to see those same smiles that I saw on the face of those newly baptized Russians on the faces of our friends and family here. 
I want to hear those same cries of joy that I heard from those old Tennessee mountaineers so long ago. I want to hear those same cries from the lips of our neighbors and from ourselves. I pray for it daily. I have seen that first century church, and I want to see it again. And what we need to realize is that it is possible here, now, among us. The same spirit that moved among those first apostles moves among us. The same spirit that empowered them empowers us. But we have to realize that we can't make it come. God is the one who sends the wave. We have to be ready to catch it when he does. And what that means is being in the center of his will. And that's hard to do because we live in a world that pulls us so many different ways. So many voices out there saying, pay attention to me, I'm most important. Come this direction, go that direction. We need to be in the center of God's will, focusing on him. And that means reading and studying and applying the word of God to our lives. That means praying continually. That means humbling our hearts and realizing that maybe we're not right all the time. Accepting what the Lord has to say to each of us. And it means reaching out to everybody around us. To the people we love. Maybe especially to those that we don't love. Because those are the people who just like us need to hear the love of God. Only God can make a move in people's hearts. But he does that through what we do through our witness, through our love, through what we say and do. It means putting behind us our favorite games that we love to play, our favorite sins we love to partake of, and our favorite feuds we love to keep in our heart. It means walking past all those places of the Spirit that we're used to stopping before and dallying around and going beyond those into a new place of faith that we are shown by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So this morning, the question I have to ask is, do you really want to see revival? If you do, you have to pray for it and act for it. You have to hunger for it and put anything that blocks your vision of it out of the way. Put it behind you and be determined to play with that no more. Sing and pray and praise God, for that is the strength of your joy and power in Him. Tell people, and show people the love of God. Because that is the power of your witness among people. Souls are what it is all about. We need to focus on them. And on Jesus Christ. And everything else is secondary. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you sent people into our lives. Whether it were our grandparents or parents, whether it was family or friends or teachers or Sunday school teachers or preachers, no matter who it was, we thank you for the people that you sent into our lives who showed us your grace and mercy and love by exhibiting Jesus Christ before us and sharing the good news with us. Help us to be such witnesses to those around us too, that through us they may see you and come to know of your love and mercy and grace. Lord, we are unworthy vessels and often unwilling vessels, but Lord, you show your strength through our weakness. We humble ourselves and we open our hearts to you and ask that you would move with the power of your spirit upon us and through us into the community around us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.